welcome to a special bonus sneaky mini episode of The Partial Historians. I am one of your hosts, Dr. Ran. And I'm Dr. G. Welcome. So Dr. G, we thought we just had to do a special mini episode today because we've been talking about the codification of the laws for what seems like an age. (laughs) If it feels long to us, just imagine how long it felt to the Romans. Exactly. And so we wanted to do a quick episode where we run through what exactly are the 12 tables. What are on those little tablets, as it were. Yeah. Exactly. And if you're confused about anything of what we're saying right now, please go and listen to our narrative episode so you understand where this fits in the scheme of things. <laughs> Goodness me. Um, all right. So, I mean, we know that there are, there ends up being 12 tables. Yes. And as far as we're aware, they start off by writing 10. Yes. And then they come to a decision that 10 is just not enough. Absolutely. And they add another two, which gives us a lovely round dozen. It does. It mm. does. It does indeed. And so uh, I thought we'd uh, we might just chat through what exactly they focused on with yeah. these with these laws, Doctor G. Yeah. So each tablet has its own sort of theme or subject. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Or so, so they would le- have us believe, of course. Ooh. Yeah. Yes. We'll leave you, <laughs> listeners, to be the judge. <laughs> All right. So shall we begin with table one? Ooh. Please do. I'm very excited. Okay. So the the general theme of table one is proceedings preliminary to trial. Mm. So it's basically all about the lead up to, you know, taking someone to court and what the obligations are. Wow. Yes. And the Romans do like taking people to court. So knowing what the rules are around that's probably pretty useful. Yeah, absolutely. So things like if the plaintiff summons the defendant to court, the defendant shall go. (laughs) I think it's important to note that that is the first law of the 12 tables. If somebody summons you to court, show up. Uh, That would be good. Thank you. I actually kind of like that because it, kind of shows some similarity with the way that our legal system works. <laughs> Have you considered not showing up? Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> to be to be followed by, if the defendant attempts evasion or takes flight, the plaintiff shall lay hand on him. Ooh. Mm. Mm, I do like a good laying of hands. Um, <laughs> I suspect that's code for violence. <laughs> I think so too. Yeah. Mm. Uh, now, what if you're sick, Dr. G? Or you're too old and you just it's just not easy to get around. Okay. If this is a problem... I hope yeah. that means I don't have to go to court. <laughs> A vehicle shall be granted. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> it's like, you know, court summons, the court taxi arrives, and you're like, oh man, I really have to go. <laughs> if he does not wish, he shall not spread a carriage with cushions. <laughs> the wisdom of the ancients. Uh, and you're telling me we had to have a whole sort of like 50 year lead in for the codification of this kind of stuff. <laughs> there shall not be cushions unless it is wished. <laughs> It's important stuff. This is important stuff. Yeah. Um, so this is the kind of the, the general theme of, uh, of these laws. Um, if one of the parties does not appear, the magistrate shall adjudge the case afternoon in favour of the one present. Oh, well, that makes sense. I yeah, so. you turn up, you win. Yeah, I think that makes sense too. Yeah. Um, when the parties agree on the matter, the magistrate shall announce it. Okay. Yeah. Yep, fair enough. Yeah. So far, so good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, this this is the kind of thing we get in the table one, all, mm. all the all the trialy kind of thing. Yeah, there's a little fragment um, right at, that we have from table one that mm. we're not really sure quite what to do with. Yeah, I put it to you, which refers to a platter and a loincloth, um, which Ooh. which fascinates me. But we literally they're like the only words that we have. <laughs> we're not sure how they add up to anything. How that works into a trial is difficult to imagine. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's probably really important to note that we don't have the 12 tables, despite their lauded significance in early Roman Republican history, we don't have a complete set of them. No. Even though reputedly Roman school children still had to recite them and learn them off by heart well into the imperial period. Um, Yet, even then, we do not have a full uh, extant version but that's Obvious. the catch, isn't it, Dr. G? They were reciting them. <laughs> they were reciting them, yeah. They were writing them down, were they? No. They were reciting them. But they were written down somewhere. Somewhere, yeah. Yeah, yeah. in order to recite them properly. Yeah. <laughs> Unless they had to learn it by repeating what someone else had said. Oh. No, I don't think so. Okay. But yeah, <laughs> what, what we have is basically yeah, just what we can piece together from various accounts. Yeah. Mm. All right, so table number two. Yeah, now we're heading to the trial itself. The trial itself, yeah. The preliminaries are over. It's now the trial is taking place. Not a huge amount uh, on this one in comparison to table one. A little bit less. 
Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so we have uh, some elements related to uh, penal sums. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow, yes, get out your uh, fasquitas calculator for this one. <laughs> um, the, the solemn deposit shall be either 500 asses or 50 asses, mm-hmm. which it, there's a big difference there right yeah. off the bat. Yeah. Um, it shall be argued by solemn deposit with 500 asses when the property is valued at 1,000 asses or more. But with 50 asses, when the property is valued at less than 1,000 asses. It's a little bit of differentiation there, depending on how wealthy you are as to how much you have to pay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. which I, I mean, that's, that's good. That's a provision that is protecting people in different economic strata. Yeah. I like the little bit after that, though. Mm-hmm. But if the controversy is about the freedom of a person, although the person may be very valuable, <laughs> yet the case shall be argued by a solemn deposit of 50 asses. <laughs> People, you're only worth 50 asses. We don't care how special you think you are. (laughs) Uh, The human body can only be valued at 50 asses. Yeah. Uh, Which is, this is important because obviously we're getting a little bit of elements of things related to freedom and servitude. Definitely. From a Roman perspective here. Yeah, and it is interesting to have this kind of thing because slavery is definitely in been a part of Rome's story as long as we've been telling it but it is kind of very background information at this point in time you know there's there's not a lot where slaves are front and center certainly our narrative sources don't have huge amounts of interest in talking about what's happening with the slave population even though we know it exists yeah definitely Um, and this means that it's kind of like a little bit lost to us because we don't have a lot to go on archaeologically either at this point yeah um, so yeah, so all of a sudden we have them come through as a representation in the second table, which is all of a sudden we're like, ah, some evidence. Excellent. Yes, yes. So I, I only highlighted one other uh, element of this uh, table as being of interest to me, yes, which was uh, the last provision. Uh, I hope you were going to say that. <laughs> Whoever needs evidence shall go every third day to shout before the doorway. <laughs> <laughs> I can only presume evidence a beer. <laughs> yeah, I can only presume that's like their way of gathering what they need. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I require evidence. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that too. I, I, I kind of imagine what do historians have to do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of uh, ranting at doorways. Saying, Excuse me, after a piece of evidence. <laughs> Where was Spartacus born? Tell me now. <laughs> uh, which brings us on to table three. The execution of judgment. So a lot of legal stuff that we're dealing with here, which I'm, I'm going to flag that I'm going to flag this now. When we've been talking about the codification of the laws, this wasn't exactly what we were imagining we were going to get. I mean, it is definitely an important part of it, you know, how you go to trial, what the procedures are. So don't get me wrong. I can see how it's somewhat in keeping with what we've been talking about, but it's certainly not the focal point of what we've been talking about. And this is certainly not satisfying the issues that arise in the struggle of the orders about who has power. Um, This is not to do at all with magisterial uh, powers and how they are operated and who gets to hold them. This is very much about what appears to be like private law sort of cases. I want to sue somebody. How do I do that? Yeah. Um, Which is... Not what we were expecting, no. I think, in this grand lead up of the struggle of the orders, patrician versus plebeian. Yeah, exactly. And we can see that really with um, some of the tables in here. So things like 30 days shall be allowed for payment or c- of confessed debt and for settlement of matters adjudged in court. <laughs> it's just business, business, business. Yeah, like, alrighty then. Yeah. Um, things that I've highlighted from table three, execution yes. of judgment. He shall bind him. (laughs) Oh, I suppose I should have the whole provision, just not get to the juicy part first. (laughs) Unless the debtor discharges the debt adjudged, or unless someone offers surety for him in court, the creditor shall take the debtor with him. Mm. Uh, So this is a real problem. You can just sort of like take him, take the person who owes the money away. um, And that's like kind of the outcome of things. Not only that, he shall bind him either with a thong or with fetters of not less than 15 pounds in weight or if he wishes he shall bind him with fetters of more than this weight (laughs) very precise well the important thing is that the fetters have to weigh at least 15 pounds that's anything a lot anything less it's not good enough (laughs) it's not gonna do the job oh dear oh dear so yeah this is obviously this is again interesting because it's obviously it is somewhat touching on the stuff that we've been talking about um in the sense i suppose of 
um, the debt bondage issue. Yes, this yeah. is, this seems to be massively honing in on like debt bondage and what happens when a creditor calls in the debt and you are simply unable to pay. And now we have some what are some pretty clear legal provisions around how the creditor is allowed to treat you. Yeah. Uh, which it turns out is pretty unpleasant. Yeah, absolutely. Although I do like this one. Meanwhile, they shall have the right to compromise. And unless they make a compromise, the debtors shall be held in bonds for 60 days. Two months. Harsh. Yeah. I mean, like these, these chains. Goodness me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And things do go downhill um, if you are in debt. Um, because you can be brought toward to the Praetor, mm. which... You know, that technically, I think they do exist to a certain degree, but we don't know what the Praetor really does at this point and well, could yes. be conflated with the Consul as well. I was going to say, we don't really know what the Consuls do at this stage. We don't, either. yeah. <laughs> we're not really sure what the Praetor does. Yeah. Um, so during these days, so this is within the 60 days, mm. um, they shall be brought to the Praetor in the meeting place on three successive market days. Mm. Um, so the market days don't happen every day. Yeah. And the amount for which they have been judged liable shall be declared publicly. Mm. Moreover, on the third market day, they shall suffer capital punishment or shall be delivered for sale abroad across the Tiber River. So it seems that what happens is that there's three opportunities in order to pay off the debt to get out of this situation. And so you're brought out publicly as the person in debt bondage. The nature of your debt is publicly declared, presumably allowing your allies, family members, people to to come forward to pay that debt. Absolutely. And if it was paid, you'd be able to go. Yeah. Uh, if you're not able to get that system to work in your favor, you either are capitally punished, which is obviously bad. Yeah. And potentially even worse, um, your debt is then unsold into slavery. So Absolutely. you're no longer in debt bondage. No. Um, but it, it does progress to actual slavery. And that, that's definitely something I think that the people we've been talking about would have been concerned about. This is hugely yeah. concerning. I yeah. think anybody who is in a situation where you are not in the top strata of society, this is something that could reasonably happen to you. Yeah. Um, and this idea of being sold across the Tiber River suggests that this is a natural boundary line of what demarcates Rome as Rome as opposed to elsewhere. Yeah, definitely. All right, that brings us to table four. Slight shift of tone, Dr. G. And I've got to say, I love the direction we're going because I think this is very interesting. Paternal power. Oh, dad. (laughs) And this, of course, is interesting because, um, as we should note, um, some people might be familiar with phrases like smash the patriarchy, (laughs) down with the patriarchy. I know that we certainly are. Um, Patriarchy is... This is where it comes from. Yeah, this is where it comes from. It's about rule of the father, not rule of men. And Rome is definitely a very patriarchal society because the father has huge amounts of power. And this is really where we see it all stemming from. This is where it's codified. Yeah. And part of the thing that we want to keep in mind, I think, when we're talking about things like the Twelve Tables is that a lot of this stuff is presumably already at play. This is not a creation of new laws necessarily no no. this is noting them down so that they can be witnessed yes and people can refer to them publicly and openly with without a sense of secrecy definitely and we've already seen some of these patriarchal powers in play in the stories that we have told i mean brutus comes to mind you know the um in the beginning of the republic um what he had to do with his sons but I'll, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Let me let me read out some of them. So the, the probably the the first one is probably the one that most people know about, which is a notably deformed child shall be killed immediately. Yes, yes. Um, we are living in different times when we're thinking about early Rome. Yes, definitely. Um, and then, sort of building on that, I suppose we've got to a father shall be given over a son the power of life and death. Yeah, and this is the ultimate in patriarchal authority. Uh, if you yeah. displease your father, your father can murder you and nobody's going to blink an eye. It kind of gives new meaning to that thing that I've heard some people say these days where they say, I brought you into this world and I can take you out of it. Yeah, it's better literally the law. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's literally a Roman law, not just, yeah. a, not just a funny threat. Yeah, yeah, that is yeah. not a threat. That yeah. is for real. Yeah. Um, uh, if a father thrice surrenders a son for sale, the son shall be free from the father. Yeah, so this leads into things that have implications for later Roman law because Mm. this is the sort of thing that allows um, 
a son mm. to be independent of yes. that patriarchal authority. Yeah. That can be really important um, yes. for certain Roman men at certain points in their life. And it is not necessarily the case that it's seen as a breaking of all family connection. Yeah. But it is a legal mechanism that allows certain freedoms to take place. It does also, to me, testify to a certain desperate... Uh, like a certain desperation that might exist in a family if, you know, if parents are looking at their children in this way, you know. <laughs> Can I sell them? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. um, But this is not a sale into slavery necessarily. Yeah. This this does become something that is much more symbolic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And it's about much more, like, legalistic lines and yeah, inheritance yeah. and things like that. Sure, sure. Um, but, yes, it does have that sort of um, idea embedded in it as well yeah. that you could potentially sell your children if you needed to yeah um to repudiate his wife her husband shall order her to have her own property for herself shall take the keys shall expel her great there is no provision for the wife <laughs> to repel the husband of course none whatsoever this no. is the tablet about uh paternal power <laughs> yeah. uh, and finally a child born within 10 months of the father's death shall enter into the inheritance well that's good to know that makes total logical sense yes yeah. if we're shoring up patriarchal uh structures obviously the father um is the more significant parental figure in yeah. any birth um uh, yeah so i've highlighted um this reference to the wife because it's the first time we have mention of a specific provision relating to women mm. and it is often the case and we see it all the time in our narrative sources as well is that yeah. women seem to be invisible largely yes, uh, to yes. what is playing out yeah uh, but they do have a significant role to play in certain cases yeah and this is certainly going to become true when we get into table number five yes which is absolutely. all about inheritance and guardianship yes so table number five, we start off with women, even though they are of full age, because of their levity of mind, shall be taken under guardianship, except vestal virgins. Like That's why they're my women. Yeah. yeah. Who shall be free <laughs> from guardianship. Their yeah. mind has not so much levity. Yes, it's amazing what happens when you never have sex. <laughs> <laughs> you simply just don't go mad the same way other women do. So that's pretty That's pretty cool to, you know, to actually see the Vestal Virgins being mentioned, you know, 12 tables. They found their way into the codification of the laws. How are you feeling? <laughs> I'm feeling pretty excited. <laughs> um, but yeah, this, is, this has got huge implications. Um, we see the flow and effects yes. of Roman legal code in the way that Western society historically has thought about women. Yes. And a provision like this, which basically dismisses women as just not having the same mental capacity as men. Yeah. This has had huge thousands of years worth of historical implications. Yes, definitely. It's a huge problem um, to get to this. And obviously, if you were coming to this, you were like, well, if my only way out is to be a vessel virgin, I suppose... I suppose I have to join the order. <laughs> yeah, I know I would. Yeah, no, it, it's it is pretty um it's pretty interesting when you think about the fact that this is so early and yet you know so much later in Rome's history. Um, you know when you know I've been studying stuff, it it's still this this whole idea of having a guardian and that them conducting business for you. It's still so much a real thing. You know, it's in yeah, yeah in some parts of the world this is still being practiced. So yeah, yeah. So a lot, uh, there is actually quite a lot, as you can probably imagine, in this uh, in this fifth table, because obviously inheritance and the the passing on of property is obviously a big concern um, for the people who are crafting these, and that's primarily because the people crafting these are wealthy people with got, got a lot some property, to yeah, with <laughs> a lot of property. Um, so there's obviously laws regarding um, what happens if you have no direct heir which you'd probably be expecting to see. And um, basically, if that happens, the property will go to the, like, basically your next male relative, you know, the closest male um, early, um, relative. And if there's no one who fits that description, then male clansmen <laughs> will inherit the estate. Yeah. And the importance is the male element here. Yeah, yeah, definitely specifically mentioned. Um, and then there's also talk about, yeah, that, that idea of guardianship. Obviously, people standing, people standing in place and, and being the, um, the guardians of property is obviously the focus in the second part here as well. Yeah, yeah. so we've got this sense that um, not only is it about preserving male lines, but mm. it's also ensuring that at every step of the way, um, the provision to protect property is reinforced. Yeah, definitely. 
Uh, and that's going to take us on to table six, Dr. G, which is ownership and possession. Mmm, I yeah. love a good bit of possession. Love a good sense of ownership. <laughs> <laughs> when a person makes a bond and conveyance according as he specified with his tongue, so shall be the law. I see. I his word is his bond. <laughs> well, I, I mention that because I think that that is a nice acknowledgement of the sort of oral nature of a lot of what's going on, you know, in... Yeah, in that a society. verbal agreement is a legal agreement. Yeah, as far as anyone's concerned. Yeah, exactly. And I guess because we've been talking so much about this, I, this whole idea being about, um, you know, setting down the laws... You know, rather than it being just out there. <laughs> um, so I just think it's kind of interesting that there's still an acknowledgement that obviously this is, you know, verbal culture. This is an oral culture. Yeah, yeah. This is this is making explicit what was implied. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else tickle your fancy on table six? Oh, okay. table six. Mm. If any woman is unwilling to be subjected in this manner <laughs> to her husband's marital control... She shall absent herself for three successive nights in every year, and by this means shall interrupt his prescriptive right of each year. Love it. So this is obviously about the types of marriages. Like, yeah, yeah, so this seems to be a reference to the marriage with the hand. Yes. The conferatio yeah. uh, union, which is the oldest type of Roman marriage yeah. um, that we know about, but also one that seems to be practiced mostly by the elites mm. um, and not necessarily by... All and sundry. Yeah. Um, so there's some specific provisions for this. But basically, if she absents herself um, for three nights of the year, what this allows her to do is, I think it allows some of the retention of her claims to her natal family. Yes. Um, as opposed to falling wholly and solely under the patriarchal authority of her husband's family. Yeah. So there's, there's a slight differentiation there. And there'd be good reasons why... Uh, her male relatives might want her to do that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, there's also a provision to not take framework timber that is fixed in buildings or in vineyards. I was just Don't. about to say that. <laughs> Don't steal the wood. Yeah. Somebody has gone to a lot of effort to chop and put that in and you are not allowed to take it. <laughs> now, Table 7 is about real property. And and a... <laughs> I've got to say, this one is a bit hard to um, pull something meaningful out of because it's very bitsy. Yeah, sometimes we've only got fragments of like a single word. Yeah, this is this is troublesome. Uh, but I did, I did, I did find the last one a bit interesting, which is probably one of the more complete ones. A slave is ordered in a will to be a free man under this condition: if he has given ten thousand asses to his heir, although the slave has been alienated by the heir, yet the slaves, by giving the said money to the buyer, shall enter into his freedom. Wow, Ooh, that's technical language. <laughs> He is. Yeah. Find a way. He, he will get out of this slavery. Yeah. Definitely. Um, a bit about slavery, but the rest is very... I mean, and, and again, interesting that, you know, you've got people being obviously mixed in there with all sorts of kinds of objects. Yeah, there's lots yeah. of things that uh, that come up under real property that I quite like because it feels like you're getting an insight into what real life might have been like for really particular Romans. Yeah, yeah. It shall be lawful to gather fruit falling on, upon another's farm. So essentially, if they haven't harvested the, the fruit, um, you're allowed to take it because once it falls off the tree, it, it's common. It's out there. I'm a fruitarian. <laughs> We, we only eat things that have fallen off the tree and are, in fact, dead already. <laughs> yes. Well, and I think that's fair enough. Yes. Um, yes. So, yeah, this idea that there shall, you will not allow there to be any waste. Yeah. Like, if the person who owns that tree has yet to, to pluck all of its fruits, you may pluck its fruits from the ground. Yeah. Uh, branches of a tree shall be pruned all around to a height of 15 feet. Yeah, it's very specific. I think I think this might be to help with like things like carts going underneath it. It or makes maybe... sense, but I just can't believe that this is what we're getting. <laughs> <in> <laughs> the, these, are, these are the kinds of details <laughs> because it just you know, and this is this is why it's it's good to look at these sorts of things and not just the histories. The histories make it sound so dramatic, you know, which obviously it is to a certain point. But then when you go into the nitty gritty of laws, it is about these sorts of very 
Be like, you did not prune the tree properly. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> it's very practical. It's, it's actually kind of refreshing. You know? Yeah, it's, yeah. As you say, it's everyday life. And know? I love this kind of stuff yeah. because, I mean, there's more tree provisions as well. <laughs> if a tree from a neighbor's farm has been felled by the wind over one's farm, <laughs> one rightfully can take legal action for that tree to be removed. Oh, that's such a common thing these it's days. It's such a neighborly dispute. It's, it being like, you have dispute. got to get rid of that tree. Yeah. The other person's being like, it's not my fault that the wind broke off the branches. <laughs> and they're like, too bad. <laughs> All right, I think it's uh, time to move on to table number eight. Mm. Torts and deluxe. Mm. 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 Yeah. I didn't really know what to make of this at first by the, <laughs> by the title because I'm not a lawyer. But there are some delightful fragments in here. There's some great fragments in yeah. this table. <laughs> Whoever enchants by singing an evil incantation, if only that was a finished... Yeah, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, I don't know, don't know <laughs> what happens to that person, but it's so ancient worldy it <laughs> is it is and the idea of like curses comes into this as well and Definitely. i feel like so there is a second provision that follows on from this because some of the text seems to have broken off yes. if anyone sings or composes an incantation that can cause dishonor or disgrace to another he shall suffer a capital penalty oh, yes and they're taking it seriously yeah yeah and then there's another little bit which it's not quite after this but it kind of connects to the theme we're talking about here Whoever enchants away crops, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Nor shall, an, shall one lure away another's grain, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, I don't know. You lured away my grain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so definitely this is obviously all about um, making amends for ill done to other people. Yeah, yeah. and this leads into things like um, stealthily cutting pastures at night. If you go and crop somebody else's pasture yes. under the cover of darkness yeah uh that's a capital offense yeah you're not allowed to just steal somebody else's grain while they're <laughs> sleeping no. and be like look it's an early harvest and it, there's a bit about there's a bit about uh thievery as well theft. Mm-hmm. um if a thief commits a theft by night if the owner kills the thief the thief shall be killed lawfully. Mm. Yes, yeah, so that, that sounds that sounds very modern. That does. To some does. countries, anyway, for me. <laughs> <laughs> and the only other one that really uh, struck out at me in, from this one is um, the trouble with being a false witness. Oh. So if you're convicted of speaking falsely as a witness, mm. uh, the punishment for that is to be flung from the Tarpeian Rock. Ooh, yeah, that's serious. That's serious. serious. Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised you didn't mention the fact that there was a platter and loincloth uh, mentioned in there again. <laughs> I do like a little bit of a loincloth. I don't know how those two <laughs> things go together, to be honest. <laughs> and having said that, that some of these um, penalties also relate to a type of capital punishment. So stuff to do with like cropping people's uh, fields at night, which you shouldn't do. Mm. Um, you get hung up as your capital punishment, mm. which is... Uh, seen as a sacrifice to Ceres. Ooh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the grain goddess herself receives you as a capital punishment sacrifice, which is that seems big. Yeah, definitely. Um, the only other thing that really there's actually quite a lot on this table, but the only other ones that kind of jumped out at me was there is this mention here. Um, if a patron defrauds a client, he shall be accursed. Yes. So a bit of bit of patron client stuff going on there, a bit of protection potentially for the client. One provision One in provision. all of this that might make it easier to be a plebeian. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is on a completely separate note, but just again jumped out at me something interesting. No person shall hold nocturnal meetings in the city. <laughs> How dare you? I feel like we've had a lot of nocturnal nocturnal meetings in the city in yeah, our narratives. I, I agree. All right, table number nine, public law. Mm. Yeah, this, look, there's not many provisions here. Yeah, no, I was going to say, this is a little bit brief, this one. Uh, I suppose the last one kind of jumped out at me. For anyone whomsoever to be put to death without a trial and unconvicted, dot, 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 is forbidden. <laughs> <laughs> is that the only thing that we I shan't, was like, We shan't have that. Um, it, they do have a provision against uh, corruption at a judicial level. Yes. So a judex or an arbiter legally appointed who has been convicted of receiving money for declaring a decision yes. shall be punished capitally. Um, so no bribery yeah Yeah. and we shan't have bribery here and that brings us to I think something that should be your kind of wheelhouse I think which is table 10 sacred law (laughs) sacred law yeah yes a dead person shall not be buried 
or burned in the city. Unless they're a vestal and they have been naughty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, this uh, explains a lot about what we see along the Appian Way, which is famous for being a sort of like an outpost for various family uh, sarcophagi and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and certainly... It doesn't help us with uh, what's going on with the Vestals. But it might be the case that in the early version of the city, that where they're buried is outside the Pomerium, and only later it falls inside the Pomerium. Very true, very true. Now, there is a mention of women, though, in there this There is. Area. Yeah, women shall not tear their cheeks or shall not make a sorrowful outcry on account of a funeral. It's a bit harsh. Are you not allowed to mourn? Not theatrically. No. <laughs> this is, might be where the British get their stiff upper lip from. Uh. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff about um, burial, as you probably imagine, obviously, with, you know, sacred lore and that kind of thing. Um, anything else jump out to you with the burial stuff or anything? Oh, yeah. yeah. So whoever wins a crown mm. himself or by his property, yes. by honour or by valour, the crown is bestowed on him at his burial. Mm. And that's kind of exciting. Yeah. Because then we have an additional uh, provision, which, wait for it, nor gold shall be added uh, to a corpse. <laughs> you shall not add gold to a corpse. So, goodness knows. Um, but if anyone buries or burns a corpse that has a has gold dental work, it shall be without prejudice. <laughs> uh, you don't have to don't have to work open the jaw <laughs> of a dead loved one to prize out that gold truth think, before you exactly, bury them. It's saying if you have gold... Already, 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 you That's can take okay. it with you. But yeah. otherwise, there shall be no adorning with gold. No, for no the gold burial. For you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's not waste the gold on the burial. Yeah. So they're trying to tone down what see maybe uh, appears to be some ostentatious burial practices that yes. seem to be taking off because a lot of these provisions involve how much you can spend. Absolutely. Um, yeah. In mourning or on the funeral. Yeah. So there's, um, a, there's a bit about place. But yeah, there's definitely that thing about expenditure and and that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. So and also consider practicality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, considerations of space, like how close your funeral pyre could be to somebody else's. Yes, exactly. <laughs> You're like, Which sounds very sensible to me. It yeah. does. It does. Yeah. All right, now we get to the really controversial ones, Doctor G. Ooh. Okay, so the, so according to our account, the ten tables were produced in the first lot of Desenvirs. Yeah, this is by the, the first lot of Desenvirs, I should say. Yeah, the yeah. first round of Desenvirs, and they come back after a lot of thinking and uh, conversation. Yep, and they're like, "Here are the ten tables." And of everyone Roman seems law. to be very excited and pretty, you know, pretty into them. Yeah, but they just feel like there's just mm-hmm. something that's not quite on. I the feel money. like you haven't covered everything. Yeah. So then we go into the more controversial period of the Decemvirs. Mm, yeah, the which, second round of Decemvirs. Yeah, not which, the same group necessarily as the first no. group, except for one. Yeah, we haven't quite explored all of this in, in full detail at the moment of recording, but we will have shortly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So table 11, the supplementary laws. The supplementary laws. Yeah, look, I feel like the big one here is there shall not be intermarriage between plebeians and patricians. And that's really the one that jumps out because the others are very fragmentary um, and not really that controversial as far as I can see. But But that one seems to be particularly controversial. That one is very controversial. And and it does make sense in the sense that... um, So what we've been talking about so far is that even though our accounts are telling us there's this huge divide between patricians and plebeians, we definitely see naming conventions which don't quite match up with this idea that there is such a divide all the time between them. But if they were putting this law into place now to say that going forward there shall be no marriage between them, well, that is a different story. Yeah, and you have to wonder where that has come from and why they want that distinction preserved. Yeah. It is, it is concerning, to it say is the concerning, least. Yeah. And so this kind of, I suppose, would tie into this idea that the patricians were kind of um, solidifying their privilege uh, rather than making laws that are going to... Yeah, yeah, this certainly yeah. doesn't seem like a win for for the plebeians necessarily. No, um, no. And possibly not a win for the patricians either because it's really taking a stance to cement the divide. Yeah, absolutely. As far as we can tell. So that's the one that really stands out. Table number 12. Is there anything... I don't think there's anything super controversial. Yeah, um, table 12, again entitled Supplementary Laws. Yes. Um, even more. 
Um, but these things relate to um, animals for sacrifice, mm. um, households and slaves. But these don't seem to be anything that's necessarily out of kilter with stuff that we've read no, earlier no. into the ten tables. So, so really, it's, about, it's a lot of hoo-ha about something on table eleven, really. Mm. Yeah, the, re- the the rest of table twelve, as you say, it's very much the kind of stuff we've been seeing so far about yeah. private property and and the, and how the households should operate. And that yeah. Kind of thing. yeah, and I think the really big one, if there's anything in table twelve, mm. it's that it's the last provision that we have in in this fragment, which is whatever the people ordain last shall be legally valid. Mm. So uh, it allows um, a a stepping away from, like, um, traditional callbacks to case law. Yes. Being like, but there's precedent for that thing. And it's like, no, no, this is the decision that is valid. Yes. Um, The one that was most recently voted on. Mm. I feel like that's a good thing. Yeah, I think that that yeah. ad, that is interesting, yeah, and it yeah. will have real consequences for how things operate on a legal level. Yeah, and it relates to the people, which seems like it's it's telling us something about the way that decisions are reached yes. in the public space and how they are to be considered going forward as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Dr. G. Well, that's the end of our, it turns out to be not so mini, but (laughs) sneaky special episode on the 12 tables. It is special. Yeah. We hope that that gives you a bit of an idea of the kinds of laws that are being produced. And as I said before, this this episode is really designed to be a supplement to our narrative episodes on this topic. So please go and check them out. Yes, we will catch you next time for more of the narrative.